you don't have the slightest reason to fear, men you don't have to constantly gauge or be on guard against or keep an eye on. They recounted the saga of the bookseller that is now echoing through the building, the tale of how this Bavarian, a gnarled stump of a man, really and truly yelled at a Russian. It all happened right outside the couple's door, when an Ivan grabbed the bookseller's wife as she was coming back with water. She won't let her husband go to the pump because he was in the party. The woman shrieked, and her husband came running out of the apartment, making straight for the Ivan and shouting, You damned bastard! You prick! As the saga has it, the Russian piped down, shriveled up and backed off. So it can be, after all. The Russian's barbarian animal instinct must have told him that the bookseller was capable of anything at that moment, that his rage had blinded him to all consequences, so the soldier simply relinquished his booty. It's the first time I've heard of one of our men responding with that kind of red-eyed wrath. Most of them are reasonable. They react with their heads. They're worried about saving their own skins, and their wives fully support them in this. No man loses face for relinquishing a woman to the victors, be it his wife or his neighbours. On the contrary, they would be censured if they provoked the Russians by resisting. But that still leaves something unresolved. I'm convinced that this particular woman will never forget her husband's fit of courage, or perhaps you could say it was love. And you can hear the respect in the way the men tell the story, too. End of Side 4 Side 5 But they didn't come just for conversation. They've made themselves useful. They'd brought a few boards, which they sawed off to size on the kitchen table and nailed up diagonally across the jams of the back door. They had to work quickly so as not to get caught by some Russian. As payment, we handed out cigars from the ample supply the Major brought yesterday. We really are quite rich. After the entire door frame was boarded up, a Russian appeared on the back stairs. He kicked hard at the boards, tried to break in, but without success. That was a relief. Now we won't have strangers barging in night and day. Of course, they also come to the front door, but that has a good lock and is made of solid wood. As it is, most of the people who know us call up from outside just to reassure us. Zdjez Andre means that it's Andre, and the Major and I have worked out a special knock. A touching story. Around noon we have a visit from Fräulein Bain, our fearless lead mare from the basement. She's now lodging with young Frau Lehmann, whose husband is missing in the east, and helping out with her two children. To date, neither the young mother nor Fräulein Bain has been raped, although both are quite nice-looking. It turns out the small children are their great protection. They understood this from the first night of Russians, when two rough men showed up, shouting and pounding their rifle butts and demanded to be let in. When Fräulein Ben started to open the door, they just pushed her into the room, then stopped in front of the crib where the baby and four-year-old Lutz were sleeping together. One of them said, in flabbergasted German, Small child? They both stared at the crib a while, and then stole away on tiptoe. Fräulein Ben asks me to come up for a couple of minutes. They have two Russian visitors, one older, one young. They've been there once before, and today they've brought some chocolate for the children. The women would like to speak with them, so they've asked me to play interpreter. Soon we're all sitting across from one another. The two soldiers, Fräulein Ben, Frau Lehmann, with Lutz clinging to her knee, and me. The baby is right there in her stroller. The older Russian asks me to translate, What a beautiful little girl, a real beauty and he winds his index finger into one of the baby's copper curls. Then he asks me to tell the two women that he also has two children, two boys, who are living with their grandmother in the country. He fishes a photo out of his battered cardboard wallet, two crew-cut heads on paper that's turned a darkish brown. He hasn't seen them since 1941. I've figured out that concept of home leave is foreign to nearly all the Russians. Most of them have been separated from their families since the beginning of the war. That's nearly four years. 
I assume that this is because most of the war has been fought in their country, and with the civilian population being transferred back and forth, no one knows for sure where his family is at any given moment. On top of that, there's the enormous distances and the pitiful condition of the roads. It's also possible that, at least in the first years of the German advance, the authorities were afraid their people might desert or go over to the other side. Whatever the case, these men were never entitled to home leave like ours were. I explain this to the two women, and Frau Lehmann says, full of understanding, Well, that excuses some things. The second Russian guest is a young boy of seventeen, a former partisan who joined up with the westward advancing troops. He looks at me, brow deeply furrowed, and asks me to translate that in his village German soldiers stabbed some children to death and took others by the feet and bashed their heads against a wall. Before I translate, I ask, Did you hear that, or see it yourself? He gazes off and says in a stern voice, I saw it twice myself. I translate. I don't believe it, answers Frau Lehmann. Our soldiers, my husband, never. Fräulein Ben tells me to ask the Russian whether the soldiers in question had a, a bird here on their caps or a bird there on their arms. In other words, whether they were Wehrmacht or SS. The Russian understands the question right away. The villagers probably learned to make that distinction. But even if it was SS men in this case, our conquerors will consider them part of the nation and charge us all accordingly. Talk like this is already making the rounds. Today at the pump I heard several people say, Our boys probably weren't much different over there. Silence. We all stare into space. A shadow has fallen in the room. The baby pays no attention. She bites the foreign finger, cooing and squealing. I feel a lump rising in my throat. She seems like a miracle to me, pink and white with copper curls, flowering here in this desolate, half-looted room, among us adult human beings, so mired in filth. And suddenly I realize why the warriors are drawn to the little baby. Sunday, 6th of May, 1945 First for the rest of Saturday. Once again the Major showed up around 8pm with his Asian orderly, who reached into his bottomless pockets and this time pulled out two turbots, by no means large, but fresh. The widow breaded and baked the delicious fish, which we then all shared. Even the Uzbek was given a piece in his corner window, which he always makes a beeline for, just like a loyal dog. A very tasty meal indeed. Did the Major stay the night? I wouldn't have dared undress on my own, wouldn't have dared to go to sleep in the room alone, I know that. Even though our back door is now boarded up, even though the war is no longer raging outside, there's still a strong dose of fear in all of us. Fear of people who are roaring drunk or in a fury. The Major is our protection. Today he was limping, his knee is still swollen. The widow, who has gentle hands for that kind of work, made him a compress before he joined me in bed. He's confessed to me the funny nickname his mother used to call him, and he translated my own name into Russian, using an affectionate diminutive. So I guess we're friends. Nevertheless, I keep telling myself to be on guard and to talk as little as possible. In the morning, alone again, we sat around Herr Pauli's bed, ate a solid breakfast, and listened to what was going on outside. Finally, the widow ventured into the stairwell and ran upstairs to the booksellers, where a dozen neighbours are still rooming together. When she came back, she said, Here, give me the rest of the Vaseline. She was swallowing hard, and her eyes were full of tears. She'd heard that the liquor distiller had returned to his wife, in the night, under cover of darkness, creeping and crawling through the front line, right past the troops, together with Elvira the redhead, who'd been helping him man his post in the distillery, though why, I can't say. Was it a joint defence of the liquor bottles? 
There must be something rooted in us, some instinct that makes us sink our claws into our possessions when threat looms near. Together the widow and I went up to the apartment on the fourth floor. It turns out that the distiller's buxom wife, the one from the basement who'd been honoured with the first Russian advances, had been living unmolested in her fourth-floor apartment ever since. Just a minute, while I do the calculations. For over a week. Equipped with a tub full of water and a decent stock of provisions, she's been left entirely to herself. I can believe it, too. Although it took us a while to figure out, the fact is, the Russians dislike climbing stairs. Most of them are farm boys, used to living close to the earth, in homes with only a single floor, so that they are not very experienced stair climbers. Moreover, they probably feel too cut off when they're so high up. That four flights of stairs is too long a retreat. As a result, they hardly ever dare go that far up. We tiptoe into the apartment, as if entering a sick room. The redhead is sitting on a kitchen chair, staring off into the distance. Her feet are in a bucket of water. She's soaking her toes, which are battered and bloody, according to the distiller. His own feet look just as bad. They both passed through the front line in their stockinged feet, through streets full of rubble and ruin. The Russians had taken their shoes. The redhead is in her slip, with the blouse draped over her. Probably from the man's wife. It is far too big. She sits there, groaning as she moves her toes, while the man tells us how his distillery was in the middle of the fighting for two whole days, how first German, then Russian soldiers had helped themselves to what was left of the alcohol. As they were rummaging for liquor, the Russians finally found Elvira and him behind a wooden partition, along with another woman, an employee who'd sought shelter there as well. Here the man shrugs his shoulders, doesn't want to say any more, walks out of the kitchen. They lined up, his wife whispers to us, while the redhead stays silent. Each took his turn. She says there were at least twenty, but she doesn't know exactly. She had to bear the brunt of it herself. The other woman wasn't well. I stare at Elvira. Her swollen mouth is sticking out of her pale face like a blue plum. Show them, says the distiller's wife. Without a word, the redhead opens her blouse and shows us her breasts, all bruised and bitten. I can barely write this. Just thinking about it makes me gag all over again. We left the rest of the Vaseline. There was nothing to say, so we didn't try. But Elvira started talking on her own, although we could barely understand her lips were so swollen. I prayed while it was happening, she said, or words to that effect. I kept on praying. Dear God, thank you for the fact that I am drunk. Because before the boys lined up, they plied her with whatever they'd found, and they kept giving her drinks in between. And for all of this, we thank the Fuhrer. Apart from that, there was much to do in the afternoon, a lot of wiping and washing. The time passed. I was astonished suddenly to see the Major standing in the room. The widow had let him in. This time he'd brought a brand new pack of cards, which he laid out on Pauli's quilt. Apparently the two men have found a game they both play. I don't have the faintest idea what it is, so I've slipped off to the kitchen, where I'm quickly writing this down. The Major has even brought some play money, German coins, three and five mark pieces, which were withdrawn from circulation ages ago. How on earth did he get them? I don't dare ask. He didn't bring anything to drink for which he apologises to each of us. No matter. Today, he's our guest. We inherited a bottle of liquor from the distiller. Monday, 7th of May, 1945 It's still cool, but clearing, a little ray of sunlight. Another restless night. The Major woke several times and kept me up with his groaning. His knee is supposed to be getting better, but it still hurts when he bumps it. Despite that, he didn't let me rest much. Among other things, he talked about the drink-and-be-merry sisters who moved into the abandoned apartment on the ground floor. 
Apparently they're very popular with the Russian officers, who call them Anya and Lisa. I saw one of them on the stairs, very pretty, dressed in black and white, tall and delicate. As he reported their goings-on, the Major looked uncomfortable and slightly embarrassed. He himself had been invited into the apartment that morning in broad daylight and found the girls in bed with two men. Laughing, they invited him to join in, an offer that continued to shock the proper middle-class Major as he was telling me the story. Apparently a prime attraction for the soldiers is the one sister's very cute three-year-old son, who can already babble a few words of Russian, according to the Major, and whom the male guests pamper as best they can. Moving right along. The New Day. It's so strange living without papers or calendars, clocks or monthly accounting. A timeless time, which slips by like water, its passing measured only by the comings and goings of men in their foreign uniforms. Occasionally I'm amazed at how determined I am to capture this timeless time. This is actually my second attempt to carry on a conversation with myself in writing. My first was as a schoolgirl. We were fifteen or sixteen, wore wine-red school berries, and talked endlessly about God and the world, sometimes about boys as well, but very condescendingly. In the middle of the school year, our history teacher had a stroke, and was replaced with someone who had just finished her training, a snub-nosed novice who exploded into our class. She brazenly contradicted our patriotic history book by calling Frederick the Great an adventurer, a gambler, and praised Friedrich Ebert, the social democrat whom our former teacher had enjoyed deriding as a mere saddler's apprentice. After making these audacious declarations, she would flash her black eyes, lift her hands, and appeal to us, Girls, you better go and change the world. It needs it. We liked that because we didn't think much of the world of 1930 either. In fact, we emphatically rejected it. Everything was so muddled, so full of barriers and obstacles. Unemployment was in the millions, and we were constantly told that practically all the professions we aspired to had no prospects, that the world wasn't waiting for us in any way. By chance, elections to the Reichstag were being held then, the ten or fifteen largest parties convened assemblies every evening, and we would march over in little groups, spurred on by our teacher. We worked our way from the National Socialists, through the Centrists and the Democrats, to the Social Democrats and Communists, raising our arms in the Hitler salute with the Nazis, and letting ourselves be addressed as comrade by the Communists. That's when I started my first diary, out of a desire to form my own opinion. For nine days, I believe, I faithfully wrote down the gist of what the speakers had said, along with my youthful rebuttals. On the tenth day I gave up, although my notebook still had many blank pages left. I couldn't find my way out of the political undergrowth. It was the same for my friends. Each party, we felt, was partly right, but they all engaged in disreputable tactics, horse-trading, we called it, the haggling, the lobbying, the jostling for power. No party seemed clean. None stuck uncompromisingly to their principles. Today, I think, we probably should have founded a party of sixteen-year-olds just to satisfy our moral demands. Whatever grows older grows dirtier. Monday, around noon, we had a visitor. Not from the building, and not from next door, but from distant Wilmersdorf a district in the west of the city, two hours from here by foot. A girl named Frieda, whom the widow had heard of but never met. Thereby hangs a tale, which begins with the widow's nephew, who was a medical student once upon a time. One night he was assigned to air raid duty at his university. A young female medical student was assigned as well, and their joint watch produced a pregnancy and a shotgun wedding. The bride was nineteen, and the groom twenty-one. Then the war machine snatched him and sent him off to the front, and no one knows where he is. His wife, however, who is now in her eighth month, moved in with a girlfriend, the Frieda now sitting on our kitchen chair and bringing us news of the outside world. The widow's first question. And you, did they also? 
No, Frida is still unscathed. Well, not entirely. Some Russian pushed her against the wall of the basement, but had to run off and fight so he couldn't take his full pleasure. It seems the soldiers reached the block where the two girls are living shortly before the surrender and galloped through without setting up camp. The expectant mother had tapped her belly and said, Baby, and they didn't touch her. Frida delivers her report and turns to us with blank, shiny eyes. I know that look. I saw it far too often in my mirror, back when I was living off nettles and porridge. And that's the predicament the two women are in now, which is why Frida took it upon herself to make the long, arduous journey here. Through streets, she says, were completely silent and deserted. She asks if she could have some food for the widow's niece by marriage and the child who is on the way. She tells us that the young woman spends the whole day flat on her back and gets dizzy at the slightest attempt to stand up. A nurse who looks after her occasionally explained that when a mother isn't getting proper nourishment, the fetus sponges off her body's calcium and blood and muscle tissue. Together the widow and I look for what we feel we can give. Some of the major's butter and sugar, a tin of milk, a loaf of bread, a piece of bacon. Frida is ecstatic. She herself looks pitiful. Her legs are like sticks, and her knees jut out like gnarled bumps. Even so, she's quite cheerful and not afraid of the two-hour trip home. For our part, we are happy to have this envoy from the distant district. We ask her to describe in detail the route she took, to tell us what she saw. We pet her and beam at this calf-like, half-starved eighteen-year-old, who mentions that she once wanted to teach gymnastics. Well, there won't be much demand for that any more. Not here. Not for the foreseeable future. People are happy not to have to make any extraneous movements. Or at least the others are. The people going hungry. Right now this doesn't apply to me. I still have my strength. The widow hits a sore point when she suggests to Frida, Well, my child, couldn't you find some halfway nice Russian and give him a pretty smile, so that he'd bring you girls a little something to eat? Frida gives a smile, a little foolishly, and says that there are hardly any Russians left on her block, otherwise... And she packs up the presents and stashes them in the shopping bag she brought along. Her visit really bucks us up, so we're not entirely cut off from the world. We too could risk hiking across town to see friends and acquaintances. Since Frida came, we've been planning and scheming, wondering whether we should take our chances. Herr Pauli is against the idea. He sees us both being nabbed and sent off somewhere to do forced labour, possibly to Siberia. We think of Frida, who managed to do it, and keep on planning. It's late afternoon as I write this, and I've just returned from my first big trip. It came about very unexpectedly. I was sitting at the window seat even though you hardly see anyone on the street now except Russians and people getting water. And lo and behold, a Russian comes bicycling right up to our door. It's the Major. I race downstairs. He has a sparkling new German man's bicycle. I beg and plead, could I take it for a ride, just for five minutes? The Major stands on the curb, shakes his head. He's not sure what to do. He's afraid that someone might steal the bike from me. At last I persuade him. Sunshine. The weather turns warm in the twinkling of an eye. I pedal as fast as I can. The wind roars in my ears. I'm speeding because it makes me happy after being so miserably cooped up all the time. And also because I want to prevent anyone stealing the bike. I race past blackened ruins. In this part of the town the war ended one day earlier than where we are. You can see civilians sweeping the streets. Two women are pushing and pulling a mobile operating unit, probably recovered from the rubble, sterile lamps ablaze. An old woman is lying on top under a woolen blanket. Her face is white, but she's still alive. The farther south I ride, the further the war recedes. Here you can even see whole groups of Germans standing around and chatting. People don't dare do that where we live. There are even children outside, hollow-cheeked and unusually quiet. Women and men are digging around in the gardens. There are only a few isolated Russians. A Volkssturm barricade is still piled up in front of the tunnel. 
I dismount and push my bike through a gap in the barricade. Beyond the tunnel, on the lawn in front of the S-Barn station, there is a knee-high mound strewn with greenery, marked with three wooden posts painted bright red and affixed with small handwritten plaques, edged paper under glass. I read three Russian names and the dates of their death, 26th and 27th of April, 1945. I stand there a long time. As far as I can remember, this is the first Russian grave I've seen so close. During my travels there, I caught only fleeting glimpses of graveyards, weathered plaques, bent crosses, the oppressive neglect of poor village life. Our papers are always reporting on how the Russians hide their war dead as a disgrace, how they bury them in mass unmarked graves and stamp down the earth to render the spot invisible. This can't be true. These posts and plaques are obviously standard issue supply. They're mass produced according to a pattern with a white star on top. Coarse, cheap and thoroughly ugly, but at the same time utterly conspicuous, glaring red, garish and impossible to miss. They must put them up in their country, too. Which means that they, too, practice their own cult of graves, their own hero veneration, though officially their ideology rejects any resurrection of the flesh. If the plaques were just there to mark the grave for future reburial, a simple sign with the name or number would suffice. They could save themselves a lot of red paint and star cutting. But no, they envelop their dead soldiers in an aura of red, and sacrifice both work and good wood to provide them with an aureole, however paltry it may be. I pedal on as fast as I can, and soon see the former manor house where my firm was last housed. I wonder about the family on the ground floor, if the little baby made it through the milkless time. No children, no young mother, none of them are there. Finally, after much knocking and shouting, an elderly man appears, unshaven and wearing an undershirt. It takes me a while to recognise him as the authorised representative of our former publishing house, someone who was always immaculately groomed from cuff to collar, now in a dirty state of decline. He recognises me, but doesn't show the least bit of feeling. Grumpily he tells me how he and his wife snuck over here when their apartment was hit on the last day of the war. The place was deserted, all the furniture carried off, whether by Germans or Russians, he can't say, presumably both. Inside, the building is ransacked, wrecked, and reeks of human excrement and urine. Even so, there's still a mountain of coal in the basement. I scrounge around for an empty carton and pack it full of briquettes, much to the man's displeasure, but the coal is no more his than it is mine. The idea of helping me doesn't occur to him. With effort, I haul the box over to the bike and tie it onto the luggage rack with my belt and a bit of string I find lying around. Back home, on the double, I race up the street, this time past endless rows of soldiers hunched on the curb. Typical front-line men, tired, grimy, dusty, with stubbly chins and dirty faces. I've never seen Russians like this before. It dawns on me that we've been dealing with elite troops, artillery, signal corps, freshly washed and clean-shaven. The lowliest types we've ever seen are the supply train men, who might have smelled of horses but weren't nearly as battle-worn as these soldiers, who are far too exhausted to pay attention to me or my bike. They barely glance up. It's clear they're at the end of a forced march. Quickly, quickly, there's our corner. The old police barracks is swarming with automobiles, that hum with a deep, satisfied drone. They smell of real petrol. The German cars never smelled like that. Gasping for breath, I proudly carry the bike upstairs, along with my load of coal. This time it's the Major who comes running down towards me. He's all agitated, imagining his bike stolen and me who knows where. Meanwhile, the Uzbek has drifted in as well. Right away the widow sends him to the pump with two buckets to get water for us. He trots off good-naturedly. He's become like part of the family. I'm sun-drunk and exhilarated from riding fast. I feel more cheerful than I have in weeks, practically elated. On top of that, the Major has brought some Tokay wine. We drink it. I feel good, cosy as a cat. 
the Major stayed till 5 p.m. After he left, I felt rotten. I cried. Weeks later scribbled in the margin to be used by novelists. For three heartbeats her body became one with the unfamiliar body on top of her. Her nails dug into the stranger's hair. She heard the cries coming from her own throat and the stranger's voice whispering words she couldn't understand. Fifteen minutes later she was all alone. The sunlight fell through the shattered panes in broad swathes. She stretched, enjoying the heaviness in her limbs, and brushed the tousled fringe back from her forehead. Suddenly she felt, with uncanny precision, a different hand burrowing into her hair, the hand of her lover, perhaps long dead. She felt something swelling, churning, erupting inside her. Tears came streaming out of her eyes. She tossed about, beat her fists against the cushions, bit her hands and arms until they bloomed red and blue with tiny tooth marks. She howled into the pillow and wanted to die. Tuesday, 8th of May, 1945, with the rest of Monday. Evening came and we were all alone, Herr Pauli, the widow and I. The sun went down red, a repugnant image that reminded me of all the fires I'd seen over the past few years. The widow and I went to the little pond for some dirty washing water. For drinking water a German still has to count on an hour's wait. It might have been 8 p.m. We're living without a clock because the one wrapped in a towel and hidden in the back of the chest keeps stopping. Things are quiet around the pond. The murky water is littered with bits of wood, old rags and green park benches. We fill our buckets and trudge back, letting the cloudy liquid inside the third one slosh away as we carry it between us. Beside the rotting steps that lead up the grassy slope, we see something, a shape on the ground. A person, a man, lying on his back in the grass, knees bent and pointing upward. Is he sleeping? Yes, and very soundly too. The man is dead. We both stand there gaping. His mouth is hanging open so wide you could stick your whole hand inside. His lips are blue, his nostrils waxen, caved in. He looks about fifty, clean-shaven, bald. Very proper appearance. A light grey suit with hand-knit grey socks and old-fashioned lace-up shoes that are polished and shiny. I touch his hands, which are splayed out on the lawn next to him. His fingers are crooked into claws, facing up. They feel lukewarm, far from the cold of rigor mortis. But that doesn't mean anything since he's been lying in the sun. There's no pulse. The man is definitely dead. His body hasn't been looted, though. There's a silver pin in his tie. We wonder whether we should check his vest for papers in case there are relatives to notify. It's a creepy feeling, disturbing. We look around for people, but there's no one in sight. I bound a few steps down the street and see a couple standing in a doorway, a young woman and a young man, and ask them both to please come with me. There's a body lying over there. Reluctantly they follow me, pause beside the dead man a moment, don't touch a thing. Finally they leave without a word. We stand there a little longer, at a loss, and then we leave as well. Our hearts are heavy. Nevertheless, my eyes automatically register every little piece of wood, and just as mechanically, my hands stash them in the bag we've brought expressly for that purpose. Just outside the door to our building, we run into our old friend, Curtinman Schmidt, together with our deserter. I'm astounded that these two have dared ventured out onto the street. We tell them about the dead man, the widow imitating the position of his mouth. Stroke, mumbles the ex-soldier. Should we all go and have another look? I wouldn't, says Curtinman Schmidt. Next thing there'll be something missing from his pockets and everyone'll claim it was us. And then he says something that makes even us immediately forget about the dead man. The Russians have all left. While we were getting water from the pond, they moved out of our building and out of the block and drove off in the trucks. Curtinman Schmidt describes how well upholstered these trucks were. 
with mattress parts and sofa cushions from the abandoned apartments. They're gone. They're all gone. We can hardly believe it. Out of some involuntary reflex, we look up the street, as if trucks had to be arriving any minute with new troops. But there is only silence, an eerie silence. No horses, no neighing, no roosters. Nothing left but horse manure, which the concierge's younger daughter is already sweeping out of the hall. I look at the sixteen-year-old girl, up to now the only person I know who lost her virginity to the Russians. She has the same dumb, self-satisfied look she always had. I try to imagine how it would have been if my first experience had come in this way. But I stop myself. It's unimaginable. One thing is for sure, if this were peacetime and a girl had been raped by some vagrant, there'd be the whole peacetime hoopla of reporting the crime, taking the statement, questioning witnesses, arrest and confrontation, news reports and neighbourhood gossip. And the girl would have reacted differently, would have suffered a different kind of shock. But here we are dealing with a collective experience, something foreseen and feared many times in advance that happened to women right and left, all somehow part of the bargain. And this mass rape is something we are overcoming collectively as well. All the women help the other by speaking about it, airing their pain and allowing others to air theirs and spit out what they've suffered. Which, of course, doesn't mean that creatures more delicate than this cheeky Berlin girl won't fall apart or suffer for the rest of their lives. For the first time since the 27th of April, we were able to lock the door to our building. And with that, unless new troops are housed here, we begin a new life. All the same, at around 9pm someone called up for me. It was the Uzbek, repeating my name over and over in his laboured voice. Actually, the Russified version of my name that the Major bestowed on me. When I looked out, I saw him cursing and making threatening gestures at me and pointing at the locked door with great indignation. Well, my chubby friend, that won't help you one bit. But I let him in, the Major close at his heels, limping badly. It's clear that the bicycling hasn't helped his condition. Once again the widow fixed some compresses. His knee looks hugely swollen and dangerously red. I can't imagine how anyone could bike, dance, or climb stairs with that. They're sturdy as horses. We can't keep up. A bad night with the feverish Major. His hands were hot, his eyes bleary. He couldn't sleep and kept me awake. Finally, the new day dawned. I escorted the Major and his man downstairs and unlocked the door, which once again belongs to us. Afterwards, we had a revolting job. The Uzbek evidently had some kind of dysentery and sprayed the toilet, the wall and the floor tiles. I wiped it up with issues of a Nazi professional journal for pharmacists and cleaned things as well as I could, using nearly all the water we brought from the pond yesterday evening. If only Herr Pauli knew, with his constant grooming and his sissy manicures and pedicures. It's Tuesday. Around 9 a.m. the secret knock, which we still use even though there are no longer any more Russians in the house. It's Frau Wendt with the eczema. She's heard a rumour that peace has been declared. The last of the uncoordinated German defence has been broken in the south and north. We have surrendered. The widow and I breathe more easily. Good thing it happened so quickly. Herr Pauli is still cursing about the Volkssturm. All those people senselessly sent to die at the last moment, old, tired men, just left there to bleed to death, helpless, with not even a rag to dress their wounds. Fractured bones jabbing out of civilian trousers, snow-white bodies heaped on stretchers, and bleeding in a steady drip. Every trench and passageway blotted with slippery, lukewarm puddles of blood. No doubt about it, Pauli had been through a rough time which is why I think the neuralgia that's kept him chained to his bed for over a week is half psychosomatic. It's a refuge, a retreat. 
He's not the only man in the building with that kind of refuge. There's the bookseller, for instance, with his Nazi party affiliation, and the deserter with his desertion, and any number of others with this or that Nazi past that makes them fear deportation or something else. They all have some excuse when it comes to fetching water or venturing out to perform some other task. And the women do their best to hide their men and protect them from the angry enemy. After all, what more can the Russians do to us? They've already done everything. So we put on our harness and pull. That's logical enough. Nevertheless, there's something about this that bothers me. I often find myself thinking about the fuss I used to make over the men on leave, how I pampered them, how much respect I showed them. And some of them had come from cities like Paris or Oslo, which were farther from the front than Berlin, where we were under constant bombardment. Or else they'd been in places where there was absolute peace, like Prague or Luxembourg. But even when they were coming from the front, until 1943 they always looked neat and well-fed, unlike most of us today. And they loved to tell their stories which always involved exploits that showed them in a good light. We, on the other hand, will have to keep politely mum. Each one of us will have to act as if she in particular was spared. Otherwise no man is going to want to touch us any more. If at least we had a little decent soap. I have this constant craving to give my skin a thorough scrub. I'm convinced it would make me feel a little cleaner in my soul as well. A good conversation in the afternoon that I want to record as precisely as I can. I still have to mull it over. The hunchbacked chemist from the soft drink plant showed up again. I'd practically forgotten about him, although we often exchanged a few words down in the air raid basement. Until recently he'd survived in a neighbouring basement that the Russians never discovered, but where he nevertheless heard all the latest news, particularly about women raped while getting water. One of the victims, a very short-sighted woman, lost her glasses in the struggle, so that she now staggers about completely helpless. It turns out that the chemist is a comrade, meaning he was a member of the Communist Party until 1933. He once even spent three weeks with the Intourist group travelling through the Soviet Union, and he understands a few words of Russian, none of which he admitted to me in the basement, any more than I told him about my own travels and language skills. The Third Reich cured us of that kind of hasty confidence. Still, I have to wonder, so why didn't you stand up and identify yourself to the Russians as a sympathiser? He looks at me, embarrassed. I would have, he claims. I just wanted to let the first wild days pass. And then he adds, In the next day or so I'll go down and report at the town hall. As soon as there are authorities in place, I'll put myself at their disposal. My own sense, which I didn't share with him, is that the reason he didn't come forward is because of his hunchback. With so much male fury seething all around, he would have felt doubly bitter about his deformity, which would have made him seem pitiful, half a man in the eyes of those strong barbarians. His head is set deep between his shoulders, he moves with difficulty. But his eyes are bright and intelligent, and he is very articulate. So, have you lost a little of your enthusiasm? I ask him. Are you disappointed in your comrades? Hardly, he says. We shouldn't look at what's happened too personally. We shouldn't be too narrow in our perspective. It's a case of urges and instincts having been unleashed. A thirst for revenge, too. After all, we did a few things to them over there in their country. Now it's time for change and introspection for us as well as for them. Our old West is a world of yesterday. A new world is being born, the world of tomorrow, and it's a painful birth. The Slavic nations are stepping onto the stage of world history. They're young and full of unspent energy. The countries of Europe will blast open their borders and merge into larger regions. Just as Napoleon swept away all the little kingdoms and tiny fiefdoms, the victorious superpowers will do away with the nations and countries. So, I said, you believe that Germany will become a part of the Soviet Union, a Soviet Republic? 
and that would be nice. Then they'll take away our homeland and scatter us far and wide to destroy our sense of nationhood. It's quite possible that we Germans living today are really just a sacrifice, a kind of fertiliser, a means of transition. Maybe our best use is as skilled teachers. But no matter what the case, I think it's up to each of us, even under these circumstances, to make our lives as meaningful as we can. No matter where we end up, we take ourselves. Even if it's to Siberia. I have enough faith in myself that with a measure of goodwill, I would be able to create a meaningful life, even in Siberia. He certainly would, too, judging from his past performance. A hunchback, he still managed to hold a good job as the head chemist of a large soft drink and mineral water plant. But is he physically up to what the future might demand of us? Are the rest of us up to it? He shrugs. At times I think I could survive anything on earth as long as it came from without and not from some devious trick of my own heart. I feel so burned up I can't imagine what could possibly move me today or excite me tomorrow. So if one has to go on living, it might just as well be in some icy wasteland. The doctor and I shook hands, both feeling recharged by the conversation. At the moment, though, I'm completely surrounded by anxiously guarded bourgeois propriety. The widow once again feels herself mistress of her rooms. She wipes and scrubs and buffs, hands me a comb with a few missing teeth so I can comb out the fringes of the rugs. She's busy in the kitchen with sand and baking soda, moaning about her mice and figurine that lost its nose and a hand in the various lootings of the basement, whining about not being able to remember where she hid the pearl tie-pin that belonged to her late husband. Sometimes she sits deep in thought and suddenly blurts out, Maybe I put it in my sewing box. Then she starts tossing out spools of thread and old buttons and still doesn't find the pearl pin. Other than that, though, she's very capable and ingenious and unafraid of anything. She's much better at breaking up crates than I am, something she learned from watching the Pole from Lvov, whose uncontrollable temper made him particularly talented at it. Incidentally, by now, the whole house has learned the difference between Ukrainian women like this and you like this. Today the sun is out, endless fetching of water. We washed our sheets, so my bed is freshly made. A much-needed change after all those booted guests. A press of people down at the baker's. Through our shattered windows we can hear them making noise and chatting, Actually, there's no real bread today, only numbers for tomorrow's bread, or for the day after. Everything depends on flour and coal, which the baker is waiting for. Still, using a few leftover briquettes, he did manage to bake a few loaves, just for the building, and I was given a generous share. The baker hasn't forgotten that I stood up for his wife when the boys were going after her. His sales girl, Erna, the one who survived intact in the little room blocked off by the chest, brought the loaves to our apartment. In fact, the whole building chipped in a little to get this bread made. A number of the men, led by Fräulein Bain, brought a small cartload of water buckets for the dough, and a few of the women shoveled shit, as Frau Wendt so crudely put it. It seems the Russians used an upholstered bench in the shop as a latrine, pulling it a little ways out from the wall and perching on the back. So the bread is honestly earned. The Russians have brought us an odd sort of money. The baker showed us a fifty-mark bill, a kind of military issue for Germany that we've never seen before. He got it from a Russian officer for a mere fourteen loaves of bread. The baker couldn't make change, but the Russian didn't seem to mind. Evidently he had a briefcase stuffed with similar bills. The baker doesn't know what to do with the money. He would have given the Russian the bread anyway, but the man insisted on paying. Perhaps some semblance of good faith is coming back? I assume that we too will be given this money, and that our own currency will be withdrawn and exchanged, probably for half the value. 
Anyway, the prospect of bread is the first indication that the higher-ups are concerned for our welfare, doing something on our behalf. A second indication is hanging next to the front door of the building, a mimeographed notice, signed by District Mayor Dr. So-and-so, ordering us to return all goods stolen from shops and offices, typewriters, office furniture, shop equipment, etc. After an initial period of amnesty, discovery of such stolen goods will be punishable under martial law. The notice further decrees that all weapons must be turned in. Apartment buildings where weapons are found will be punished collectively, and anyone residing in a building where a Russian comes to harm is subject to the death penalty. I can hardly imagine any of our men armed and lying in wait for Russians. At any rate, I haven't seen any men up to that these days. We Germans are not a nation of partisan fighters. We need leadership, orders, commands. Once I spent several days on a Soviet train rocking across the countryside and heard a Russian tell me, Our German comrades won't storm a train station unless they've bought valid platform tickets first. Less sarcastically put, most Germans are horrified by unbridled lawlessness. Besides that, our men are now afraid. Reason tells them that they've been conquered, that any attempt to stir things up or make a fuss will only make things worse. So the men in our building have been eagerly tracking down weapons. They comb one apartment after the next. All men, not a woman among them. They ask for weapons everywhere but all they manage to dig up is an ancient firearm without a cock. This is the first time in ages I've heard German men speaking out loud or seen them moving with any vigour. They appear downright manly. Or at least what we used to think of as manly. Now we have to come up with a new and better word, one that can serve in foul weather as well as fair. Wednesday, 9th of May, 1945, without the rest of Tuesday. Up to now I've always had to start with an update on the previous night. But this time there's nothing, absolutely nothing to say about last night, except that I was able to spend it entirely by myself. Alone between my sheets for the first time since the 27th of April. No major, no Uzbek. This state of affairs led to renewed existential worries on the part of the widow who foresaw doom and destruction and no more butter. As far as she was concerned, the sooner the Major showed up with new provisions, the better. I just laughed. He'll be back. I lay in my fresh bedding the whole night long. It felt so good to stretch out. I got a full night's sleep and woke up in fine spirits. Then I washed with warm water, courtesy of the widow, put on some clean clothes, and whistled a little to myself. That's what I wrote at nine o'clock. Now it's eleven, and everything looks very different. Some people equipped with heavy scoops called us down to the street, where we shoveled the pile of rubble and manure on the corner, loading it onto a wheelbarrow. Then we carted it to a nearby rubble site, Ancient plaster and scrap metal from the air raids had been covered with fresh debris from the recent artillery bombardment, which in turn was strewn with rags and cans and lots of empty bottles. I found two silver bromide postcards made in Germany with pictures of nudes embracing, all covered with thumbprints. I was reminded of the time I was in an office in Moscow and I left some German and American newspapers lying about for a few minutes. When I picked them up and went back to reading, I noticed some pages were torn. Several ads for women's girdles and bras had been hastily ripped out. The Russians never see ads like that. Their newspapers are utterly devoid of sex appeal. So in their eyes, even a stupid ad that a man from the West would hardly give a second glance must seem like the most amazing pornography. They're bound to be interested in that. All men are. But they can't get it at home. Maybe that's a mistake. If pictures like that were available, the men could fill their fantasies with all those idealised figures and wouldn't wind up throwing themselves on every woman in sight, no matter how old or ugly. I'll have to give this some more thought. When I came back around 10am for a little ersatz coffee, I found the Major in the apartment, waiting for me, alone. He'd come to say goodbye. 
His knee isn't doing well, so he's been given two months' recuperation leave, which he's supposed to spend in a soldier's home not far from Leningrad, where he's from. He's moving out this very day. He's very serious, almost stern, keeping an iron grip on himself. Awkwardly, he carefully spells out my address on a piece of paper. He wants to write to me, to stay in touch. I can't give him the photo he asks for because I don't have any. My entire photographed past, consisting of one album and a thick envelope, burned during the bombing, and in the intervening weeks I haven't had a chance to get a new snapshot taken. The Major looks at me for a long time, as if to photograph me with his eyes. Then he kisses me in the Russian style on both cheeks and marches out, limping, without looking back. I feel a little sad, a little empty. I think about his leather gloves, which I saw for the first time today. He was holding them elegantly in his left hand. They dropped on the floor once, and he hurried to pick them up. But I could see they didn't match. One had seams on the back while the other didn't. The Major was embarrassed and looked away. In that second, I liked him very much. Then it was back outside, since I had more shoveling to do. After that, we were planning to look for wood. We need something for the stove. All the pea soup we've been eating uses up a lot of fuel. Which made me realise that no one will be bringing food, candles and cigarettes any more. I have to break the news to the widow gently when she comes back from the pump. But I won't tell Powley anything. Let the widow take care of that. My search for wood brings me to the patch of grass outside the cinema. It's the first time I've been there in two weeks. The place has become our block's local burial ground. There are three double graves among the rubble and the bomb craters. Three married couples, all suicides. An old lady who is sitting on a stone, chewing away at something, tells me the details, with bitter satisfaction, all the while nodding her head. The grave on the right is for a high-ranking Nazi political leader and his wife, Revolver. The middle grave, which is strewn with a few wilted lilacs, contains a lieutenant colonel and his wife, Poison. The old lady doesn't know anything about the third grave, but someone has stuck a stake in the sand with an inscription penned in red, Two Mullers. One of the single graves belongs to the woman who jumped out of the window when the Ivans were after her. It has a kind of crooked cross fashioned out of two pieces of door panel, shiny white paint, and fastened together with wire. My throat tightens up. Why does the sight of a cross affect us the way it does, even if we can no longer call ourselves Christians? Memories of early childhood resurface. I see and hear Fräulein Dreher, with tears in her eyes, describing our Saviour's passion in infinite detail to us seven-year-olds. For those of us in the West who were raised in the Christian tradition, every cross has a God appended to it, even if it's nothing but two splintered bits of door panels and a piece of wire. Everywhere there's filth and horse manure, and children playing, if that's what it can be called. They loiter about, stare at us, whisper to one another. The only loud voices you hear belong to Russians. We see one coming our way with some curtains draped over his arm. He calls out to us, some obscenity. Now you only see them occasionally here and there, or in troops marching off. Their songs strike our ears as raw, defiant. I gave the baker seventy pfennig for the two loaves. A strange feeling, as if I were handing him something completely worthless. I just can't believe that our German money still has any value. Erna, the sales girl, was collecting all the ration books for the household still in the building, drawing up a list of names and the number of people in each apartment. Evidently new ration cards are in the offing. She came by wearing a flowery summer dress, all done up, a rare sight. For the past two weeks none of the women dared go outside unless they were dressed like lowlifes. I'm in the mood for some new clothes myself. It's hard to grasp the fact that there aren't Russians knocking at our door, no one stretching out on our chairs and sofas. When I gave the room a thorough cleaning, 
found a small Soviet star made of red glass and a condom in paper wrapping. I have no idea who might have left that. I didn't know they even knew there were such things. In any case, where German women were concerned, they didn't feel it was worth the trouble. They took away the gramophone, along with the